uh, first speaker is Krista Somenier. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. You can correct <laughs> me, Krista. Um, is an internationally renowned media artist working in the field of interactive computer installation. She's currently a professor at the University of Art and Design in Linz, Austria, where she heads the Department of Interface Culture at the Institute for Media. Uh, pre previously, she was an artistic director and researcher at the ATR Media Integration and Communications Research Lab in Japan, where she led a research team to design interactive environments that combine novel human machine in interaction experiences, artificial life, and evolutionary Im image design. Um, and in starting in 1992, uh, she first started working with the French media artist Laurent. Mignon <laughs> to create numerous award-winning interactive computer installations. I'll leave it to you now, Krista. Mm -hmm. So she's going to put up her, her own screen. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction, uh, Tammy, and thank you also, Piero, uh, for inviting me here. It's an honor uh, to be here. I will share my screen with you. And um, I've uh, seen that I have about 20 minutes, so I try to be quite fast and show you many uh, projects. And um, I've been asked to give a short presentation about the artwork as a living system, which is in fact the title of a big retrospective exhibition that we have done recently uh, at the Zetka in Karlsruhe and also recently during Ars Electronica uh, here in Linz in Austria. Um, here we see a few, just to get you a bit into the uh, mood. These are some images from the installation at this, as it was uh, installed at the ZKM in Karlsruhe uh, in the Lichthof 3, a very nice place with uh, interactive works, but also big portraits. I will talk about them later. Um, portraits by famous media artists or media scholars. Um, we have been using the motive of the fly to create uh, portraits of people. And here is a kind of gallery of different people from the media arts. This was uh, a kind of element where we had one of our installations inside. This is an artwork we also reconstructed for the exhibition. Um, this was the mobile feelings uh, work, which was also reconstructed for the exhibition. And uh, the newest work, or one of the newest work was the augmented reality application where people could navigate through our digital archive. Uh, we have been uh, creating 30 artworks in the past, uh, oh, no, 50 artworks, so, sorry, 50 artworks in the past uh, 30 years. And I highlighted the works that were in the retrospective. It's 14 works in total. We could not reconstruct all of them because that would have been too expensive and too time consuming. But we are quite happy that we were also able to reconstruct several works that have not been shown for a long time. Um, the uh, title uh, is coming from an article that uh, we wrote in 1996 together with Mashiko Kusahara. Uh, the artwork as a living system was a title of um, a, um, a paper that we wrote in Japan. And it was also later published in the Leonardo Journal. And Karin Ollenschläger, who unfortunately uh, deceased uh, this year, uh, at the beginning of this year, she initiated uh, this retrospective exhibition and uh, um, had this idea of taking this title of the artwork as a living system and creating an exhibition, a retrospective exhibition around it. And uh, we were quite lucky uh, to do this together with the ZKM in Karlsruhe, the Oberösterreichische Landeskultur, and also the EMAL in Brussels, where the exhibition will go after the show in the OK Center in Linz. Um, we were also very happy, uh, we were also very happy that uh, Leonardo, um, MIT Press, Leonardo uh, book series, MIT Press uh, agreed to do a book with us. And uh, together with Peter Weibel, Alfred Weidinger, Karin Ollenschläger, um, this book was um, is actually ready. We have it here already. It's already available here in Linz, and it will be soon available in the US as well. Um, and we have articles by Peter Weibel, by Ingeborg Greiche, by Birgit Mersmann, by Sigrid Filinski, Tomo Moriyama, Richard Kanonier, um, and others uh, who I will later show a few. 
example of book pages. Um, this is the exhibition at the OK Center in Linz, which maybe many of you have been in Linz before. It's right in the center. It's the Offene Kulturhaus, where in the past they had a lot of uh, cyber arts exhibitions and also um, recently also uh, quite a lot of media art exhibitions and also during Ars Electronica, of course, this is a very nice location to make a media art exhibition. So we were lucky to have the first floor, the whole first floor for us. And I'll show you a few images of this exhibition. So uh, this was when we did a guided tour. Uh, when people are coming up the stair, they immediately see themselves um, on a big screen. And then they also see how they are being uh, attacked, I would say, by flies, by digital flies that would come and swarm everywhere where people are moving. And as soon as people stay still, these flies uh, swarm away and uh, go somewhere else. What we also see here in the background are nine portraits of mostly female media artists and media scholars like uh, we don't see so well here, but up on the corner, there was Jascha Reinhardt in the middle, um, um, uh, Karin Olenschläger. Then maybe here you can recognize him. This is Jill Scott and uh, Lynn Hirschman. So we tried to uh, also show some of these um, digital portraits that we make with this fly software. Then uh, here we see some more images of people interacting with this work. And we put this work right at the entrance because um, we really wanted to have people immediately realizing that they are being part of an artwork. And uh, this title of artwork as a living system actually comes from this idea that you as a user or as a participant, through your interaction, you give life to the work and you make the artwork actually living in a metaphorical sense. Um, I show you here now some examples of reconstructions. Uh, you probably all have heard of the artwork interactive plant growing that was created in 1992, where people can touch real plants. Uh, and then when they touch the real plants, uh, the voltage is captured uh, of people's interaction and then transformed into digital growth of artificial plants on the screen. And here uh, we see now um, an image of the work as it was installed at the OK Center. And we really tried to keep the artwork as much as possible the same way as it used to be 30 years ago. So the graphics, of course, we have better projectors, but the graphics software and the way how it is installed is still the same. And we see here Le Laurent uh, touching the plants to create artificial plants on the screen. Or here another shot. Uh, I don't know if I have, I should have watched the time. Uh, maybe we don't have time for the videos. Um, so let's uh, just get a very, very short uh, impression here. We see someone touching a plant and then soon a similar plant grows on the screen. Uh, another work which we reconstructed specifically for this uh, retrospective exhibition and also donated uh, as a donation to the ZKM uh, is a work called Evolf, which was created in 1994. And here people could uh, draw different shapes on the touchscreen and then see these shapes uh, swim around like living abstract animals in a pool filled with water. And uh, they could also touch these creatures in the water, interact with them, stop them, interfere in their evolution. And uh, there was a kind of, I don't have the time to go into it, but there was a complex interaction and evolution process going on using genetic algorithms. Um, and here we see the reconstruction from 2022 um, that uh, we did together with the CKM. So we were very lucky that they helped us to reconstruct the whole piece. And it worked really beautifully at the ZGAM and also at the OK Center. I'll show you here a short movie if it works. And uh, again, we kept the whole graphics and the whole interaction the same as it was in um, like 1994, um, but of course used the technology of today. So instead of a retro projection screen, we used a large uh, elite LCD screen but we kept the size of the pool and the water and also the software exactly the same as it used to be. What we see here is how one creature uh, is being swallowed by another creature. Here we see someone touching a creature with the hand in the water and then this creature 
uh, forgets what it wanted to do because basically the creatures want to kill each other. They want to add up the energy of the of the prey. And if they have enough energy, they want to reproduce and make children. And it was quite fascinating actually to see that the second and here also at the OK Center, how still people are very fascinated by this work, which is, I would say, almost exactly the same as it was uh, 30 years ago. Let's move on a little. Uh, the next work that was also reconstructed is from 95, Phototropy. Here people could use a touch uh, uh, um, flashlight, normal flashlight, to interact with insects that were living on a, on a screen. And when they switch on that flashlight, actually, so this is an image from 95, and this is an image for, from 2022. And we see here one of the curators from ZKM having a flashlight in her hand. And uh, as she interacts with the flashlight, the light, and shines some light on the screen, uh, she would uh, feed the insects with light. And eventually, the insects would come. And if they get enough light, they would start reproducing. While on the other hand, if you give too much light, the insects would die. So again, here, it's exactly the same software. Just a new uh, screen, of course, I mean, a new projector and um, a new flashlight. We had to reconstruct it, but we really tried to keep it as original as possible. Uh, I don't know how much time I have. Maybe a few more minutes. Um, I show you one more work from 2004, which was also reconstructed. Uh, this was originally made for the House of Shiseido in Tokyo. Uh, and it was installed in the lobby of Shiseido company. We see here some uh, plants hanging from the ceiling in these beautiful glass vessels and a very large screen with artificial plants. And as people touched again the plants, they would grow similar looking plants on the screen. So this was 2004 and this is 2022 at the CKM. We also got together with the CKM, they helped us to make a very large uh, voltage screen, a beautiful one. And we were hanging again the plants from the ceiling, not the beautiful glass vessels, this we didn't have anymore, but other pots. And as people touch them, this is the version in, in the OK Center. And as pe people touch these plants, they grow similar looking plants on those large screens. We have also a small video made by the CKM in Karlsruhe. And again, I would say uh, the experience from all these years, even though, of course, these works are old, but I would say from the experience that we see or observation of people when they interact with the work is quite similar to how it used to be. 20, 30 years ago. So not so much has changed in the way how people react to the artworks. Um, typewriter was another interface that we reconstructed. We have been showing it uh, for many years already, but still it had to be redone. To some degree, this was a work done in 2006 where people could type some text on the typewriter and then they would magically see some text appear on a piece of paper that was on the typewriter. And then this is the new version from 2022. Uh, they would see little creatures, little spiders appear on the paper. And then uh, these spiders would move around. They would try to survive. They try to eat up, snap up the text that you're writing and also try to uh, propagate. So this is the new version. And uh, we are especially happy that we could also reconstruct Haze Express. This was a work that was not shown anymore since uh, 1999. Uh, it was originally made in Japan uh, at the Yamas Institute when we were teaching there. But then uh, due to technical reasons and also budget reasons, we could not show it anymore. But finally, now this year for in 2022, we reconstructed it for the CKM and also made this beautiful environment with chairs um, and the items that we still kept from the original Shinkansen train in Japan. And then uh, people would sit on these comfortable chairs and as they move their hand on the screen, they would create or influence an abstract landscape, um, generative landscape 
I think we see it here, that would always recompose and rearrange itself depending on the interaction data that comes from the people's hands movement on the screen. So it's a rather abstract work, but here again, only uh, interaction really leads to the development and uh, changes of the images. You could also change the direction of where you are going with this virtual train ride and uh, basically immerse yourself in these abstract uh, images of lights and, and, and forms and shapes. Then a work that uh, was shown often already, but we still included it is Potter and the Fly. Here, people see themselves being transformed by uh, little flies. And here, that the setup at the uh, OK Center recently in, Karl uh, in Linz. Then uh, this is the last work I want to show you. We are quite happy about this one. It's actually a research project that we are doing together with uh, Oliver Grau from um, the University in Krems and also with the University of Angewandte Kunst in Vienna. And uh, we, our part is to develop an augmented reality uh, application for a digital archive of an artist, which, which is our archive, but it's also linked to the Ada archive uh, in Krems. And we see here Tiago Martins, our head developer, wearing the HoloLens. And uh, this is what he sees. Inside, he sees those different elements from our archive. And by taking uh, or using his hands and his gestures, he can navigate in this archive and interact with the different images and sounds and videos in the archive. And um, the next step will be to link it to other people's archive and then use this in a very intuitive way to make archives uh, more accessible and maybe also more playful. And the last two minutes, I want to just show you the book. Um, this is the MIT Press book I mentioned before. There were, we had a nice book launch where Peter Weibel was here and uh, also um, uh, Roger Malina joined us online. There was also Richard Klosinski here and Tomoe Mariama joined us. Uh, here just a few pages from the book. A very nice article by Karin Ollenschläger about the artwork as a living system. And here just a few pages from the book. We also tried to, since Peter Weibel um, uh, motivated us to put a lot of sketches inside and show exactly how all these, these works were done. So we put a lot of effort into also showing the making of of these artworks and give a lot of information so that students or whoever is interested uh, finds out more about this, these works. Here's just a short video, but we don't have time from the book launch. Uh, oh, Morton is here. <laughs> it was uh, the book launch event. And yes, that brings me to the end. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here with you today and later be ready for some questions. So thanks so much. Thank you, Krista. Very nice. Um, so there is, do you want to do questions now, Piero, or do you want to wait till the very end? Oh, no, no, I think you should take questions. Yeah, uh, okay. Now. So, um, Krista, there's one question. I don't know if you can see it in the chat um, from Diana Aiton Schenker. You see that? She's the director uh, of Leonardo. Yeah. Okay. And she's asking, um, what surprised you about revisiting your work this year? Mm -hmm. As ah, compared thanks. to when you first <laughs> did it. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. And also thank you for joining us at the book lunch here in Linz. This was awesome. Um, yes, what surprised us? Um, I would say what surprised us is that how fresh some of the works still appear to be, even though they're 30 years old, uh, that the way people, for example, evolve, that the way people interact with evolve, even though it's a work from the 90s, that they still fascinated by the idea of you can draw a shape and see the shape in the pool and touch it in the pool. And people stayed a long time. And we were actually a bit scared at the beginning to reconstruct works from the 90s because, you know, a lot of things have changed since then. And people are used to a lot of, you know, amazing graphics and amazing special effects, etc. So we were quite happy to see that 
they work still work in a way and can be still shown and still fascinating for people. I think that was the biggest surprise, good surprise to us. Uh, if I may, I also have a question. Um, <clears throat> um, so this uh, new media art uh, used to be counterculture and now it's becoming more and more mainstream. Um, but it's still largely decoupled from the art market, right? And so when you think of buying art, you still think of buying paintings and sculptures. Uh, on the other hand, when I look at your <laughs> installations, my God, those are complicated. It took a lot longer to do one of your installations than, than, than some of the paintings I've seen. So how, do, how does it feel to be, uh, not only for you, but for all new media artists, to be sort of, of, this, of decoupled from the, from the traditional art market? Mm. Yeah, that's a good uh, question, Piero. Um, I think the, we are not totally decoupled from the art market because we work with galleries. And if we sell something, then it's mostly smaller installations, like, for example, the pottery on the fly with the screen and the camera and the software. So these works, you can sell it, but we have to admit that these are mostly people or by people who buy this. These are mostly people who are quite techno savvy or have an media art collection or like to have something more technical. So it's a very specific group of people who buys this type of works or specific museums. But it's true uh, that media art is still a kind of very niche market. On the other hand, you know, nowadays with this NFT and digital art, we see now more and more because um, you probably know Herbert V. Franke. He had this very wonderful uh, solo show uh, last year, or was it this year? Here in Linz at the Landesmuseum. And um, many people discovered, you know, these old pioneers. He, he was 95. And uh, he was doing these very early works, uh, graphic works, digital artworks. And now he's a big star in the NFT scene. So I think now we see some kind of bridge between the youngsters that are interested in the NFT, rediscovering somehow the digital art or discovering the digital art. So I don't know how that will affect the art market or if it will at all affect the media art market. But I see there's more interests now since, since people talk so much about NFTs. But where this goes, I don't really know. Um, I just have a quick question, which is just, um, and you've probably been asked this many times mm -hmm. over many years, is why you choose insects and plants as your primary um, translators of the interaction with the human beings and, and what led to that particular thing? I think it's mostly autobiographical because I originally studied botany in Vienna mm -hmm. and then always had this feeling of unfinished business because I never finished my studies in botany and Laurent has also be, always been very interested about insects and then this whole idea of an artwork that develops or evolves or you know changes brings you, of course, to this idea to look at nature as a model and observe nature or swarming behavior or evolution or genetic algorithms. So there's, I think, a very deep fascination for the processes in nature and some wish to recreate it and make also people who interact with the systems yeah, feel attached to it and, and feel show our fascination and share this fascination. It's interesting because I think like in, uh, flies particularly have a not necessarily a positive association for human beings, you know, so it's an interesting choice of insect to use. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah, there are many people who don't like flies, of course, because mm -hmm. they're annoying. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, in art history, it's quite an interesting motif because um, in the Renaissance, artists used the flies uh, to show their, their painting skills. When they when they put flies into the paintings, so I think it's a fascinating animal. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Anik, did you have a question? Um, yes. Um, through this very quick overview of your work, I was really uh, uh, struck by the fact that a, a lot of your works 
uh, imply a collaboration between the audience, a member of the audience themselves. And at the time when they were created, it was more, and it's still the case, it was more a one person interaction with a machine, but leaving the other uh, members of the audience as spectators, as audience. Uh, in your work, it's a lot, people work together, um, exchange together. Um, so it, was it a, a, a deliberate choice? Or uh, how, why, <laughs> if you have any mm -hmm. answer yeah. to, to this? That's a good point, Anik. I think we really also like this idea when people create something together, like in the case of plant growing or in the case of Evolve, you know, they share this act of creation because then it becomes much more interesting, you know, if it's not just one person doing something, but several people. And then if you add genetic algorithms, for example, then things can become very open and open-ended. So we were inspired by this idea of the open artwork by Umberto Eco, where it's this open process where you can't, even us, we cannot completely predict what will happen. And the more people interact, the more un, unpredictable the result will be, which we find very interesting. Mm 